All right, let's go ahead and get started today. This is our uh, third installation of uh, solar electric investment analysis. And um, really what we're, our goal is for you to be able to um, do one of these analysis um, if you'd like at the end, meaning you have the, the knowledge and the skills to be able to do an analysis. Um, if you ever feel like you have more questions or need um, uh, some more detailed, uh, you know, uh, help with uh, doing an analysis. I'm sure Eric and I would be more than happy to walk you through this, uh, through an analysis one-on-one -on -one if you would make arrangements with us. So that's one of the things that we're trying to, to focus on here is uh, your uh, abilities, confidences, and uh, knowledge to be able to do some economic analysis with solar. This program is sponsored by the North Central Region SARE through a grant, and uh, we are focusing on farm uh, solar installations, uh, but you know these this type of analysis does lend itself to other types of installations as well, including small businesses, um, rural businesses, and and even could be applied to residences um, with uh, a few minor changes. So um, hopefully that you're you're uh, learning from these sessions, and please ask as many questions as you'd like to try to gain information. And uh, if you have questions about an individual location, um, your state or something, we'd be happy to try to work with you and learning more about that as well. Today's topic is going to be the value of electricity. And as we know, the the production of a solar electric system is electricity, but really trying to understand the value of that production is going to help us understand how do we begin to pay this back. And, and sometimes it seems straightforward that we produce electricity and it has a value, but every individual location, this value is going to be different. Um, and even within an individual location, depending on the size of whatever load you have, you may be on a different rate schedule that really truly impacts the, the value of this energy. So with our focus um, on farms, we're gonna focus mainly on business systems and uh, we're going to talk about the value of energy for uh, a business. Um, but again, those businesses are gonna be different sizes, um, small, medium, large, as well as different rate schedules within those businesses. So this is what we're gonna talk about today is um, the different rate structures and how they can be um, simple to complex. We're going to really focus a lot of time on net metering, which is a policy available to us in most of the states that you represent, but not all. Uh, but we'd be able to apply that if, if uh, it, it was applicable and learn how to maybe uh, not apply it if, uh, if it's not available in your area. Um, also, um, a little bit on, on grid interconnection and the flow of energy in uh, in systems and then um, how policy in in individual states affect that value of electricity um, when we talk about grid interconnection we're basically talking about distributed systems that are installed behind the meter to offset some of the electricity used in a in a small farm or a farm um, that's generally the types of systems we're talking about um, if we're trying to apply some of this analysis to a, a large system that is just selling directly to the, to the grid, it's a slightly different uh, calculation. Let's talk a little bit about some of the way we're charged for electricity. One of the things that, that uh, would be a good Im impact for us would be for you to either go home or go back to your business or look at talk to some businesses you work with and try to look at their electric bills because looking at their electric bill and understanding your electric bill is a real key uh, piece to being able to understand how do I reduce that electric bill how am I charged for electricity and where can I make some of those impacts so I have this separated into four different charges that you're likely to be able to identify in your electric bill I guarantee they're all there but they are sometimes easier or harder to identify. The first is a fixed charge, which is a charge you're charged every month and is a, at a fixed rate. And uh, everybody has a fixed charge. You can imagine, what if I used no electricity that month? What would my bill be? You know, it would not likely be zero. It would be some fixed value. Um, for a residence, that may be between $5 and $30. For a business, it could be 
25 or dollars into the hundreds of dollars, depending on, on uh, the system. Now, interestingly, this is a charge that I don't actually find on my electric bill at home. It doesn't, it's not there. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. That means it's hidden somewhere in the other charges, but it does exist. I actually called my utility and mine is $19. So I, I guarantee all of these are in your electric bill. They just might not be identified. The energy charge is whatever you're charged per kilowatt hour um, and is usually included the value of the, you can think about the energy, the, the coal it took to run the coal-fired power plant, the natural gas it took to run the natural gas power plant, the, the, the wind power, but the wind was free, but it cost to own and run that plant and generate that electricity. And so that's what the energy charge typically covers. Distribution and transmission charges cover getting that electricity to the customer. And sometimes that energy and distribution are combined into one charge. So it's just called the energy charge, but includes both energy and distribution. And then finally, demand. Demand is based on, a, is a fee based on your peak use at a given moment in time. And so if you have a, a large peak in the summer, they have to be able to plan for that. So they have a charge. I, I have set out on the right-hand side of this two kind of general schedules. And I made these up today, but they're based in kind of some uh, bills that I've seen recently. And there's two, two types of schedules here. There's general service, which I'll uh, identify as maybe small, small business. And then general service demand, which might be a small business all the way to maybe some medium to large businesses. Both have a fixed charge. In this case, I, I designated one at 25, one at 100. Um, the energy charge, in this case for general services, eight, um, that's actually wrong. It should say 0 0.08 or 8 cents, not 88 cents. Sorry about that. Um, 0 0.08 or 8 cents per kilowatt hour. And then the general service demand is 3 cents. The distribution, they don't have a distribution charge for the general service. Again, that's not because they don't um, have a cost. It's actually just mixed up in the energy charge. So the distribution charge is in the energy charge. In the, in the case of the general service demand, it's an extra cent. And then, so your total cost for per kilowatt hour is four cents. And then the, in this case, there's a demand on the demand side. If we were to have an, a solar electric system, we may not be able to offset all of these charges. The demand charge may or may not be impacted. So we still have this $12 per kW uh, that we pulled from the electric utility. We can't maybe offset that with our solar. Additionally, if we had, um, we were generating some of our own electricity, we may only be able to offset the energy charge and not the distribution charge. So in this case, the general service demand customer um, the general service demand customer may be disadvantaged from a, from a standpoint of solar installation versus a general service customer that's, again, 0 0.08 cents per kilowatt hour, not 88 cents. So spend some time with your electric bill, um, and you might learn some things. They're sometimes kind of complex. So let's think about a little line diagram of a, of a solar array and a load. In this case, the load is your business, uh, your farm, and you are connected to the grid. And if you were to use electricity, it would come from the grid. So you can imagine this is maybe at night or early in the morning, you're using electricity from the grid. And we can look at our rate schedule to determine the cost or the value of that electricity. The sun comes up and we're using now electricity from the solar, and we're using that electricity from the solar first. If we were to use more than the solar could provide, we would use it both from the grid and from the solar. But in this case, what we're using, if we use it directly from the solar, we can imagine that it's also worth, uh, it's offsetting the energy value of that, of that uh, electricity. So in this case, the full retail value of the kilowatt hour energy charge. And so, that is kind of ideal. That's the highest kind of value we can get from that electricity is to offset purchases from the electric grid. 
there may be a moment where I go to work and I turn a lot of things down and I'm generating too much electricity at that moment and I have some excess generation that's going on to the grid. The grid is required by federal law to give me, to pay for that electricity. But the real question then is, what is the value of that excess generation? And that is really what this presentation is about today, trying to explore the value of that excess generation. Because if that excess generation uh, is worth more than our solar array, thus the value of what it's producing is worth more and our paybacks are better and our economics are better. If it's worth less, it hurts our economics. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. <clears throat> and John? Yeah. Uh, I I don't want to jump in too much, but that's uh, that is the the most critical piece is is what's the excess generation worth? Too many times we we both I think see the proposals that are assuming every kilowatt hour you generate is worth the full retail rate of what you're paying, and that's that's one of the biggest challenges we see in in these proposals that are the farmers are reviewing. Right. And, and it is easy to estimate that, it, it, that it's all worth one value. And I think that's um, a sim an oversimplification, but one that is, is not necessarily a bad starting point, but should not be the final calculation. It should not be the final answer that it's all worth one value. Even this offset value down here is not one value because you may have, as you'll see in a few slides later, you may have a electric rate schedule that changes that over time. Um, so the, even that may not be worth all the same value. So it's an oversimplification to say that all, everything generated from the solar is worth one value. Let's, let's look at this in a, in a new way. Um, this is an, an electric bill, and this is actually the same electric bill on the left and the right, but we're just I rearranged and we're looking at it a little differently. Um, in this case, we can see some of the, the things that we talked about before. The, the fixed rate in the customer charge is $7 in both. Uh, the energy charge is um, right about seven, seven cents a kilowatt hour for both. Uh, but, and then there's a district, excuse me, and then there's a distribution charge, um, a demand, in this case it's a demand, and then there's some cost recovery, which might be some of the additional distribution charges. So you could say, what is the value of the electricity that I, what is the cost, let's use cost as a better word, a cost of electricity I uh, buy from my utility uh, on a monthly basis. In this case, I could take the total amount, and let's just grab my pen, I could take the total amount of what my bill was, divide it by the amount of electricity I used during the month, and that is worth 14 cents a kilowatt hour. And that's absolutely correct. It is worth 14 cents a kilowatt hour because that's what I paid for it. But at the same time, if I were to generate my own, what I generate is not gonna be worth 14 cents because in this case, on the right-hand side, there are costs that I have to pay. First of all, I have to pay the $7 no matter what, and because demand is based on how much KW I pull and my solar may or may not influence that, I probably have to pay this $548 for my demand fee. And I also have to pay this $84. So I cannot offset that with my solar. In this case, I can only offset the energy, which is the 761. I divide 761 by my 10,000 and I get 7.6 cents. So in this case, if I were to look at that, the value of my excess generation in this case could be worth as much as 7.6 cents. It's probably not worth 14 cents. And so we have to be a little careful with our electric bills of thinking what is uh, the electricity I pay for worth, but also what am I offsetting when I put in a solar array? And so uh, this is the same a look at that that electric bill two different ways. I pulled some uh, electric rate schedules from Excel Energy uh, from, and I pulled this because one of the places we presented, Excel was their, um, their electricity provider, but they, they gave a pretty good examples of some different types of service. And so I wanted to bring those up just to talk about these a little bit. Remember, we, we said that electricity has this value from a energy charge standpoint. But you can see here that a 
in the top that the standard service energy charge changes throughout the year. In the summer, it's 12.6 cents a kilowatt hour. In the winter, it's 11.4. And so if we were to simply say that it's all worth 12.6, that's not quite right. Or that it's all worth 11.49, it's not quite right. The reality is the average is somewhere in the middle. And even better would be to model it where we use these rates applied to the proper time of year. Um, so if we were to try to offset, we would offset a little lower cost in the winter time than in the summer, which works out well for solar because solar generates more in the summer. So there may, maybe if we were to apply one number, we'd apply a weighted average that would weight it towards our production in the summer. Time of use, uh, time of day service, doesn't exist everywhere, but I think is something that is becoming more common uh, for electric utilities to use. And basically, the fact is that as we use more and more at any moment in time, let's say during the peak air conditioning season in the summer, and all of a sudden maybe a farmer wants to irrigate during that peak season with an electric pump, he may have to pay very high rates during that time because all the power plants are on and even the ones that are the highest cost are running. Thus, the electricity company wants to charge more to offset their higher costs during that time. And so this would be an energy charge that has some peaking summer, winter um, during on peak and then off peak that's much cheaper. And so off peak might be um, during the nighttime really all year. And so this actually could be a situation where a farmer may be incentivized to um, pump water at night versus during the day, trying to avoid these high costs. While again, with solar, they, if they're putting electricity on the grid during those times, it could be of higher value. So when there is time of day service, usually net metering is going to follow that peak off peak pricing where they're going to calculate when not only what you gave them but when you gave it to them if you don't have that it's going to be more kilowatt it's going to be easier to compare but this is where modeling is is uh, valuable because it can do a better job of figuring out the value of that electricity on the bottom is very similar to the standard service their uh, their farm service rate is uh, fairly straightforward As we get into some of the businesses, now the previous rate was Excel's farm rate. What I have seen is that farms are on a variety of different rate schedules and sometimes they are on demand schedules and sometimes they're not. So I wanted to kind of bring, bring some of those up. Um, this is an example here where this is commercial, which could be a farm rate in some places. And so they have a customer charge based on if it's single phase service or three phase service. And now we have an energy charge that is split between a supply side and a distribution. And there are state laws in different places where it could be that the solar offsets these added together uh, is possible or it could be that they, uh, what happens is that it offsets the total, but then if you have excess generation, you only get paid for the supply side or the supply charges and not the distribution. So there's a mix of things going on, um, especially when they start to separate out these prices uh, apart. And so it's important to look at the policy in the state and see how these things um, play out with respect to the solar generation and the solar production. Those are the main points I wanted to make from those particular slides. Um, the other thing we'll, we'll talk about just briefly is that there's lots of other rate schedules out there. And to this is where looking at some different bills and trying to understand what's available to your constituents if you're working with somebody or your particular business how that works. Uh, there could be as simple as a flat rate for all the time. Tiered rates, which are this like the summer winter. The time of use pricing could have higher prices in the middle of the day and lower prices at night. Seasonal time of use pricing, maybe the winter time is all one price where you only have time of uses in the summer. And then finally, it doesn't happen very often, but real time pricing where they are charging you whatever the 
rate is on that five minute increment um, that doesn't happen too often, but could happen. And in that case, you could have some very low rates at certain times a year and very, very high rates at other times. Peak demand pricing is, is again a situation where they're looking at your peak use at some moment, some increment of time and giving you a charge based on that. Um, and that is a, one challenge with solar is that solar we know has some impact on demand, but it's difficult to model that accurately and know that that and guarantee that that's going to happen. So it's very difficult to assume a reduction in demand. Just a couple of pictures of some tiered structures. Um, most common in, in my area is this two tier structure where my winter is one, um, one period and my summer is um, another period. And I, I did bring up a second one where the summer just during the peak hours. Um, so that would be more of a, of a time of, of use in different periods of time. Um, but then also sometimes your first few kilowatt hours are worth one amount and your next kilowatt hours are worth um, less. That's also common. Okay. If one place to look at utility rates in your area is a website called OpenEI and it's a utility rate database. And I would say that a, a most electricity utilities are in this database and many of their rate schedules are on here, but not all. So um, it is fun to look at and you can look up your area and look up different rate schedules and you can simply find them uh, and, and uh, spend some time looking at them. It may be worth it to look up your rate schedule and not just your electric bill because sometimes the rate schedule itself will detail you know, maybe what my base fee is, even though it may not be on my electric bill. Uh, this presentation, we're going to talk quite a bit about net metering, but there's been times it, it, that I have discussed with uh, farmers. The farmer approaches me and says, well, the utility said I can't connect to the grid. Well, the reality is that the, the, Public Utility Regulatory Policies Act of 1978 allows any qualified facility to connect to the grid and requires that the grid pay for the electricity that, that is put on to the grid. And so you are allowed to connect to the grid by federal law and they do have to pay you for that electricity. They don't have to pay you very much for the electricity. In this case, they're suggesting that you are pay, paid no more than avoided cost for the excess generation, uh, which is usually a very low number. Um, there is a good definition for avoided cost. And I'm suggesting that is what it costs utility to generate electricity or purchase it elsewhere for just the energy portion. But there's so a lot of variability in how that is exactly defined. So I, I've seen maybe that's between one and as high as six cents per kilowatt hour are some of the numbers that I've seen for avoided cost. But you are allowed um, to, to install a system and connect it to the grid um, if it qualifies from a safety standpoint and other things. But this is where this mo model of installing a system doesn't typically give high value to the electricity generated and thus uh, net metering came in to replace it to try to incentivize more renewable generation. So I just put in some values generally that I've seen in Nebraska um, for avoided costs in retail. And so you can imagine if I'm getting only three cents for my avoided, for my excess, uh, that could be hard, uh, much less valuable than if I'm getting eight to 12 cents for my excess generation. Net metering is put in place where it's, it is a policy or rule usually put in place by a state or it could be from a utility that allows the, the customer generator to value some of that excess generation at full retail rate by only using the net excess generation to calculate how much uh, kilowatt hour use there is in a billing period. And I'm going to explain this in a number of different ways, so it, so it, hopefully it makes sense. 
So here is a, is a farm that in the green is the kilowatt hour usage during a single day. And in the yellow is the solar kilowatt hour generation during a single day. And so we can, we can imagine that the use is all the area under this green line. The solar basically, um, <clears throat> basically was always under the demand in that day. So you could imagine in this case, the solar array generated electricity and it was all used by the buildings or the farmstead, all of it. No electricity went onto the grid. It all got sucked up at that moment in time at, by the farmstead. And if electricity at a retail, their energy charges was 14 cents a kilowatt hour, all of that electricity would be worth 14 cents. Alternately on a different day, Maybe I had less fans running and other things and my load was lower for that day and my solar generation was higher. Then everything that was used by the solar, all the solar generation that got used was worth 14 cents a kilowatt hour. But the portion that actually went onto the grid, which would be this portion in yellow, that is that excess generation that we talked about in that previous slide and we've got to determine its value. So the one thing that could happen, I kind of want to move, I want to come back to that slide um, in a second. I'm gonna come back to that in a second. So here's, here's what we can think about, is that in this case, I've got, I'm back to the same slide and these three things are happening. We know that all of this is worth retail rate because we used it directly. We know that all of this is worth retail because we're paying uh, for it from the utility. But this is the question mark, what is this value? In a net metered situation, we are, we are going to pay our energy rate times A minus B kilowatt hours. And so we're subtracting a, uh, B from A. And so in the case of that this was maybe a thousand and this was 800, just so happens, then I would pay for 200 kilowatt hours and all of this 800 is equal to retail rate. And that's where net metering gives me a value for what I gave onto the grid at full retail rate for at least a portion of what I put on the grid. And what I mean by a portion is, what if there was a month where I used a thousand from the grid, but I generated 1100. Then instead of 200, I would have negative 100. And a thousand of this that went onto the grid is worth full retail rate and a hundred is worth whatever my policy says uh, in the state. In the state of Nebraska, that is worth uh, avoided cost or less than retail. Um, in the state of Michigan, that is worth retail and thus all of it is worth retail. But this being a negative, it is now a credit. So the question then is, what do I do if I have a credit? We're fairly clear on what, I, what we do if we don't have a credit, we just simply reduce how much we pay on our electric bill. If we have a credit, we need to get credit for that on our bill. And so then let's go back a slide and say, there's two different ways to deal with that excess generation credit, net, net excess generation. We could value it per kilowatt hours in monetary dollars. So I could say I'm gonna multiply that 200 times full retail rate or ex avoided cost or less in retail, whatever my policy in my state says. And then I get a credit. So if that's worth 10 cents and I use two, two, uh, 200 kilowatt hours, I get a $20 credit on my bill for that next month. Um, actually be a $2 credit. And uh, uh, if you see, 
you know, $20 credit, excuse me. I'm starting to do my simple math in my head. I'm doing it wrong. So I have my $20 credit um, onto my bill for the next month. And I just roll that over as a credit um, in, in my bill. Um, so if I had a $25 base fee and a $20 credit, I'd have a $5 bill. Uh, $5 would be my, my electric bill. There are very few, but a few states that are willing to roll that over per kilowatt hour, as a kilowatt hour, as just a kilowatt hour credit. Um, it's valuable if that happens, but it's, it doesn't happen very often. So let's go through a couple examples uh, where that might happen, and then we'll come back to that slide. Now I'm realizing I want to do this in a different order than I put it together. This is that same farm where you can see its use is in, green, in dark green, the solar generation in yellow, and the net of those in light green. So I paid a lower energy bill in January because my solar, a lower energy bill in February, March, and April, but then I had a month where I had some net excess generation. And remember, these are, are uh, the net value is in the green. So in this case, the net value for May was negative. And I got a credit of 778 kilowatt hours. And again, if that was 10 cents electricity, that'd be a $77 credit um, in June. So I got my $77 credit. I just cashed that in. We just got it. That is a monetary credit on my bill. Remember, this is monthly net metering where I'm settling up at the end of every month. I get an $81 credit in June. I get $130 credit in July. I get a $62 credit in August. And then finally in September, I'm back using more than I'm generating. And I, I have a bill that's only 308 kilowatt hours. So you can see on monthly, I just settle up at the end of every month and I'm rolling this over as a dollar credit onto the next month. And I'm basically settled up. In the case that you're allowed to roll over, and maybe one more time, I'd roll that over as a dollar credit one more time. If I had a situation where they let me roll over kilowatt hours, this number would grow each month and I'm just rolling over kilowatt hours to the next month. And thus everything is worth full retail rate in this case. And this negative keeps getting bigger each month until eventually I'm again using more than I generate and then I eat away at that credit. And so this has value to the customer if they would allow you to do it because all of these kilowatt hours got paid out at full retail rate value because it just was a credit a kilowatt hour credit rolling over or adding, 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 um, and then actually adding, and then they started subtracting away until they, they go away. So it's important to try to figure out what is your net metering policy. I call this annual net metering where they let you roll over kilowatt hours. I call it monthly when they let you uh, convert it to a dollar each month. Um, so th that's kind of my terminology, uh, but you have to read through and f figure out what yours, uh, how yours works. Now let's go back one and then just say, what does it look like if we do not have net metering? This is back to PURPA, uh, that, that PURPA slide that we had earlier. What if we, maybe the net metering policy went away um, or I decided to put one in without net metering? In this case, I would simply have my still my same two numbers, A and B, they're still keeping track of it the exact same way. But in this case, I have a energy charge for A, which is again, my retail uh, energy charge for A. And I then subtract out whatever they're willing to pay me for B, which might be avoided costs. So let's make it make up some numbers. Let's say this is eight cents for this, and this is three cents for this. And so in this case, there's no net going on. I'm not subtracting A from B. I'm simply saying all of B is worth three cents and all of eight is worth eight cents. And thus this is still worth all eight cents, but I, anything I end up giving to the grid. And so in the case of PURPA, um, I may want to consider trying to minimize my 
excess generation, what goes on to B. So I may want to size my system a little smaller so that I'm maximizing what I'm using rather than what, I, what um, having anything go to the grid. Let's look at these policies in a couple states. I'm, I'm going to use Nebraska and Ohio because that's where Eric and I are from. And I'm going to try to just look at our policies in a nutshell. Um, in, in, in Nebraska, the one thing that is not on this slide is that this only qualifies for systems that are, that are less than 25 kW. If the system is under 25 kW, it qualifies for this. If it's over 25 kW, they've got to go on either a kind of a PERPA model or whatever your utility allows. And if you're under 25 kW, state law says that you can have a, a true net metering. In this case, net metering credit is total at the end of each month, each billing period. It's the monthly. Um, and so we're A minus B. And, and if that is a positive number, you're going to, um, that credit will be equal to full retail rate. But if it's negative, then we have this net excess generation and it's going to be paid out at avoided cost. And so that's the way Nebraska deals with. Um, their net metering policy is we total it at every, and every, every month. And if the net excess generation, there is excess over what you use, you get only avoided cost for the net excess generation. In Ohio, it's slightly different. Um, in this case, uh, if you, the net metering credit, so the B version of our A and B, um, you're only reimbursed for the kilowatt hour charges, the energy charge, not the distribution. So what they have is a maybe an energy charge that might be some number like seven cents, and then they have they separated out a distribution charge again per kWh that may be three cents, and you're only allowed to get credit for the energy charge, not the distribution charge of the per kilowatt hour fees and um, demand meter charges are not reimbursed, but the net excess generation is going to vary by utility and it may be as high as retail rate or maybe lower. Um, Eric, you might, have, might up to date, uh, date us on this last one. What is net excess generation worth usually? It, it, it really depends on the utility. And I think that's an important note to make um, with our, our net excess generation for our investor owned utilities in Ohio is, is the full retail rate of generation. Um, the net excess generation uh, for most of our rural electric cooperatives is, is going to be trued up at the end of every month at the avoided cost rate. Okay. So you have a mix of avoided cost and full retail rate. And I think that's important to try to figure out. So it, it sometimes can depend on your utility. And so trying to figure that out before mm -hmm. to do these calculations co correctly is going to be important. One place to find uh, your net metering policy is the Desire website, which is um, desireusa.org, um, D-S-I-R-E, not the, not the word desire, but D-S-I-R-E. Um, that's the database for state incentives for renewables and efficiency. Um, and Eric's gonna cover this in more detail next week or on Thursday, but I wanted to at least um, get you pointed in that direction. I got a couple slides about the net metering policies from the D-S-I-R-E website. There currently are 40 states plus uh, Washington, D.C. that and a few other, other uh, of our um, of our other regions that, that are uh, controlled by the United States or influenced by the United States like Guam and others that have net metering. There are three states that absolutely don't South Dakota, Tennessee and Georgia. Or Alabama, excuse me. Uh, that absolutely do not have net metering, but PERPA would apply in those states. The other states have varying versions of net metering, but you can see here the states that have net metering, and then some states that are kind of only partially colored uh, have uh, different 
different versions within different parts of the state. And so um, Texas is an example where there's no mandatory rules, but many utilities allow it, um, some form of it. So it gives you some idea of what's available in your regions. What is the value of that excess generation? This is one uh, where we can look at the different values, uh, where the dark is they're credited um, at retail rate. This is where either you get full retail rate or theoretically um, you roll it over. Um, so there's a few states that are very, um, maybe I don't want to say progressive in that, meaning giving you good value as a customer generator of that. Um, and as we get lighter colored, they we get a little less. Um, so the second one is credits are reduced after over time. Um, the lighter blue is less than retail rate. It could be avoided cost. Um, maybe there are some states like Oklahoma where they don't compensate you at all. Basically, they zero out your excess generation, um, in which case you may want to try to avoid that if, if you can. Um, and then there's some states that have no mandatory rules with respect to that excess generation, and that's gonna be per utility. May or may not be a good deal in that sense. So, you know, um, again, uh, I wanted just to show you a couple different systems. I kind of covered this in the first one, but I wanted to go over it again. If you are grid connected behind the meter, you, you are always going to have some possibility that some of your kilowatt hours are gonna travel onto the grid and you're gonna get value from them. You're gonna use from the grid and you're gonna use from the, from the house. In this case, let's just imagine a situation where your electric grid went down. You may, this inverter is then gonna shut off and you're not gonna have any electricity from your solar or from the grid and thus, you don't have any backup. That's not necessarily good or bad, it's just the way the system works. Um, and I wanted just to point that out because that there is some interest out there at times for having some kind of battery backup. And when we talk about the value of the energy, it, um, if, if we want backup, we may not worry as much about how much our system costs because we want more of the backup idea. And so we may be able to spend more um, and our payback might not be as good. But I just wanted to kind of throw that out and I'll, I'll show you in a minute what I'm, why I'm getting at, at this. But in this case, I have a battery and that if my um, grid goes down, this disconnect throws and I still have electricity from my solar through the battery. Um, it could be from my solar directly um, kind of bypassing through the inverter to the battery and it could be from the battery to the inverter and to the house. It could be kind of one of both depending on how this inverter works. When you invest in batteries though, you there is an, a great cost for the battery. And so these numbers are a little bit old. Remember last week we talked about the cost of solar per DC watt and we talked about that that might be in the range of $1.80 about 83 per DC watt on the low side of today's marketplace. And so what I, what I would suggest we do with these numbers is simply take this into account that we could almost drop almost a dollar off of this. So this might be closer to $4 and this might be closer to maybe um, four, 420, $428. So we can start to say that that these are a little lower today, but still you can imagine you're basically more than doubling your price of your system when you start installing batteries, especially if you install them after the fact. Uh, it, there's a much, much higher cost. So I, I do tr tell people a lot that batteries aren't typically what we want, especially um, if we're trying to maximize our, our eco economics. Um, if you really need the backup, it might be something to look at, but uh, the costs are pretty high for batteries, and there is also some additional maintenance costs for batteries. So there's, there's this off-grid system that we introduced on the first day. In this case of an off-grid system, we have to have the battery. We're willing to pay that extra cost, but then because we're off-grid, we are our own utility. And then the question is, how much does this electricity cost? What is the value of that electricity? 
And that's the reason I wanted to get at this batteries a little bit is because it's easy to think about the value of the, easier to think about the value of electricity for sending it to the grid or getting it from the grid. They're dictating some of those values. If we're just simply off grid, then what is the value of that? And so I went ahead and did a couple of scenarios here. I did, what does it cost me to generate electricity from solar? And I actually did an on a grid connected on the top here and an off grid here to think about what does it cost me to generate electricity. So then I just simply did a calculation where I took the net cost of the system and I divided it by how much it generates over its life plan life. I, I used an example of a 10 kW system at 220, 215 a watt and it can generate this much in 25 years. And I calculated it at 3.6, 3.3 cents per kilowatt hour. That makes me feel good. I feel like, wow, I can, I can generate electricity cheaper than I can buy it from the grid. But we'll talk about in a second how that's not quite fair. If I'm off grid, I have a much higher cost. Um, I actually more than doubled that because I actually used some numbers from an installer that I uh, work with quite a bit. And his numbers are a little higher for off-grid systems uh, because that battery is so expensive and you're oversizing the system for off-grid. And in this case, I'm getting values that, um, and I'm subtracting the tax credits off, remember it's net, uh, um, closer to 10 cents. Now, again, we could say, well, that, that's not bad. I can generate my own for 10 cents. Why don't I go off-grid? Well, there's two, two reasons. One is, do you want to be your own utility and fix a power outage when you have a power outage and go out in a cold winter day and mess around with your battery system because all of a sudden you lost power? People don't necessarily want that. But the other thing is that this does say it's three cents and 10 cents. But again, the reason that that's not fair is that these numbers do not include O&M or other annual cost and do not include the time value of money. So basically, the fact is that you could imagine this like, well, I'm going to prepay for my electricity $12,000 for the next 25 years or some of my electricity. And that's a good deal because when I prepay, that's going to be worth 3.3 cents per kilowatt hour. But what I'm not applying is the time value of money of this $12,000. When I apply, when I think about that the value of money today is worth more than the value of money in 25 years because of inflation and other things, mainly inflation, I have to consider that and apply that to this value as well. And I can tell you that this value actually turns to be closer to 10 cents per kilowatt hour when I apply the time value of money. And this turns out to be closer to 30 cents per kilowatt hour when I apply the time value of money. So um, it is important to consider the, the time value of money. This, this calculation is not bad to do, but we also have to be careful when applying it to a comparison between the value of electricity today and the value of, uh, of what I'm paying for off the grid. So, uh, but kind of fun and worth thinking about for that off-grid system that yes, I could do an off-grid system and it's gonna cost me a pretty hefty upfront. If your system, this is only for 10 kW, you better have a fairly moderate, home, uh, moderate business um, for this to work. But again, at 30, cents, at 30 cents a kilowatt hour, that's gonna be fairly expensive electricity. But again, it depends on your motivations and maybe what it costs to connect to the grid and other things of why you might wanna do that. We're getting, we're getting towards the end here. Um, this is a couple of kind of interesting, I don't know, maybe say warnings uh, about what's going on out there. But there are a number, uh, when you sign a net metering agreement with your utility, they're gonna give you a packet that is a contract for you to sign. And it's important to read that carefully and understand what's going on. Uh, because things can, um, be in there that, that give that utility power to change that agreement based on what happens. So this is basically saying if this, if this uh, solar um, ever generates more than 120% of the customer's annual requirements, so you put in a system that 
that uh, maybe you thought was 110% of your use, and then all of a sudden you did some energy efficiency things and you generated 120% of what you used, well, then they um, can cease providing electrical service to you um, or completely change your rate schedule. And so basically they can cut you off, turn you off uh, to punish you or cause you to maybe disassemble your system. Um, and so uh, this is a real situation that, uh, that has happened. And so you have to be a little bit careful uh, with what it says in there. Another example of that um, is what about policy change? So we're seeing this happen today where um, there are states that are proposing changes in net metering. And I talked to the utility today and the utility today told me, I asked him, what if there was a change in net metering policy in the state? And he said, well, our contracts grandfather those, those systems in to the policy that, that, that was in place when they signed that contract. Well, this one does not do that. This one simply says the net metering schedule um, will be superseded by any rate schedule that, uh, that is, could be changed, could be approved by the, by the board of trustees of the company. So they could change that at any time. If they want to make that less, um, less good for the customer, it, it's changed at their discretion. Um, also, you could see ones, I've seen ones that expire after a short number of years. And the reason that they expire is not because they want to shut them off. It's because they want to be able to adopt any new policy that comes in uh, after that, that uh, expiration. So I've seen them expire after five years and then they have to re re uh, up that contract, which then allows that company to say, well, net metering went away in that five years. Now we're not going to net meter you anymore. And, and John, just uh, a, a real quick note on that. I, I always encourage the farmers that I work with, um, you know, to read these details just so that they understand them. Um, it's not necessarily to suggest this is like a negotiating chip or something you're going to change as much as it is to, to make them aware that, you know, even the, the best looking projects, I mean, the, the projects that we can, you know, do some real detailed modeling on and, and it looks like, you know, they have some really good incentives and, and they're, and their net metering policy looks good, minimize net excess generation, all that good stuff to where you say, wow, you know, this is a good net present value, a good discounted cash flow analysis. I, I love all the financial metrics. This, there's, this, the point of this is there's still a certain element of risk that lies with the fact that these rules could always change. And so uh, that's, that's one of the, the main takeaways I always try to point out with these two slides is, there's always going to be an element of risk that lies with policy that can change. Good point. Thank you, Eric. Let's talk just a little bit about escalation rate. One of the main waves I've seen uh, installers kind of make a system look better than it is, is to apply an inflation factor that is, that is far too, uh, too exaggerated or far too optimistic of, of the price, the fact that electricity is going to inflate in the future. Um, and so in this case, this is some escalation rates for a couple of different states um, in places we've taught, but you can see they follow a similar trend. And that escalation rate, um, I'll tell you, is in the two to two to two and a half percent range. So what happens is if we were to say that the nominal um, escalation rate is 2.9 percent the inflation rate is is 2.13 so the electrical inflation rate is in another half, uh, 0.6 percent so um, what's important to look at there though is look at these numbers we're looking at three to three and a half percent basically inflation and if if the number you're seeing in a proposal exceeds three and a half percent inflation for the electricity you need to ask why and be a little bit skeptical. I, I don't really mind um, it being, you know, a half a point above or below some of these, but if we start estimating five, six, 10% inflation, 
this is getting a little bit extreme and we're expecting some major change in the pricing of electricity in the United States to happen. And I'm not sure that that's quite fair because the last 30 years haven't shown that to be true. So inflation is the, one of the easiest ways a utility can lie or a, an installer can lie with respect to this, to this uh, um, analysis. So I don't mind running a mix. Maybe you get a person that is really gun ho that that we are going to have carbon legislation and it's going to change the price of electricity dramatically. Well, run it with with that inflation scenario that they're proposing, but also run it with a more realistic scenario of three percent or three to three and a half percent. And then compare the two and say, well, we're really likely to fall within this range um, because your is maybe a little extreme and this is more realistic. The fact that you're going to fall somewhere in there is uh, maybe more realistic to what could happen. And another, another simplistic way to look at that, John, if, if you add 3% energy escalation and then they also have, you know, two and a half percent inflation, in the model, when you think about the influence that makes on your cash flows table, you're going to see the the value of your energy savings go up five and a half percent annually. Right. So the combination. So there is places where you can, you know, when I talk about inflation, I'm talking about total um, inflation of energy. And if you have kind of natural inflation of the economy and inflation of energy, and you slap them together, that's additive, and it, it gets pretty high. But this is just an example of one. 1%, 3%, and 6% inflation. And you can see how that 6%, even though it doesn't seem a lot higher than, you know, it's, it's almost double of what three, but you go, you kind of stretch your imagination and think that could happen and look at the influence that it has on the cost of electricity. And I just think about here, we're sitting in 2019. If, if I really think by 2030, do I really think that we could see 25 cent electricity? Um, if we're starting at 10, I don't know. That seems a little extreme, um, and it probably is if we were to look back 30 years, um, because it did not inflate at those values previously. So we do have to be a little careful with that. I like running uh, multiple scenarios and feeling like, well, if I ran uh, 1% and 3% or 1% and 4%, I might fall somewhere if I'm looking out at, at my lifetime, you know, I might be out here, I might say, well, it's gonna fall somewhere between here and maybe here, and I, that's my range where I feel like it's, the electricity price is gonna be. I don't know where, but probably not gonna get worse than this, lower than this, or higher than this, and I can feel pretty good about what's going on. Uh, the last takeaway is that if you use the electricity that you generate, it has the greatest value. So to maximize that value, you need to use it. And sizing of a system is the best way to deal with that, um, to try to maximize the value by using that electricity. And that's what I'm talking about right here. I'm just saying, if you use more and you don't give it to them, then that is going to maximize the value of that electricity. Because we guarantee that if you use it, it's worth the full value it can be worth. So um, that's where that's important. And if um, economics is of importance to you, then that's where you would size that system accordingly. If maybe green energy is important, most important to you, it may be okay that you're giving some to the grid. Um, you're okay with that because maybe you're more interested in offsetting your entire load. That's all we have. Let's go to questions. Are there any questions for today? And, and I would say, uh, John, if, if anyone has questions, feel free to unmute your, mute yourself and, and, uh, and go ahead and ask a question. As we're thinking about that, um, next Thursday, our, our presentation is going to be on incentives. And so it's going to be interesting to look at what incentives are out there for um, individual states and individual utilities. We're going to look at generally what types of incentives are available. Then we'll actually get into a little detail and talk about maybe where some of those are available, um, both at the federal, state, and utility scale level. So um, obviously, one of the questions I get asked a lot are, you know, what are the programs or the incentive programs? And this will help you answer some of those questions. And uh, again, if you have questions, feel free to type in the chat box or simply unmute yourself and, and ask your question. Um, I had a couple notes, John, just to, to kind of follow up on. 
Uh, one thing that you talked about and did a great job of describing was how complex some of these rate structures can be. Um, just so that we're not kind of totally scaring all of the participants away to think we can never uh, fully understand all of this. Um, the, the system advisor modeling tool that, that we'll be spending all of session six using uh, allows us to, to do some really neat things as we can actually import existing rate structures um, that allow us to look at, okay, what happens if we have demand charges? Uh, what happens if there's seasonal time of use or daily time of use charges or tiered rate structures based on how much, you know, how many kilowatt hours I use? So, you know, some of the things that John's talking about, we can build into the modeling relatively easily. Um, so we'll show you that in week six. Um, the other thing, I guess, is, is it relates to, um, you know, why solar electric will not eliminate my demand. I get that question a lot, and I've, I've seen some proposals that suggest, well, um, your solar is going to be generating the most when the grid's peaking. And while that may be true, um, that doesn't necessarily impact how a lot of our demand rates are actually calculated, which is on a, you know, typically a 15 or a 30 minute rolling window that looks at what is your facilities spike in usage, not when is the grid peaking. And so there's a little bit of a disconnect with uh, the idea that, yeah, solar is generating when, when the grid's stressed. Uh, but if you could kind of visualize, uh, say, a, um, a hog barn and in the summer when all the ventilation fans are running, the sun goes down, but the ventilation fans are still running. So in that instance, you're simply moving that peak demand occurrence to a, to a later time period. So, anyhow, those are the only the only two notes I, I had um, to kind of follow up on. We we, uh, we have recorded this session. We've recorded the previous two, and Eric is sending out the links to those. So feel free to watch previous ones if you missed, and we look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Thanks, everyone. Eric, I got to head out and uh, go run and run to another meeting. But uh, but uh, we should we can chat. Um, you know, you know, maybe tomorrow or something if we want to if we need to talk to anything about Thursday. So yeah, I'll be available in the morning um, to just touch base. I guess uh, good job. I got uh, I got the everything's recorded. We'll have to. Oh um, yeah, this the file. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna gonna make myself a note to to do the. Um... <laughs>